Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Miyako Yerrick, and I am the admin for the Columbia, D.C. Regional Alumni Club. We're here tonight for The Couch, The Clinic, and The Scanner, stories from three revolutionary eras of the mind. And we have Dr. David Hellerstein, as well as Dr. Francis Onyemba here. Uh, we encourage everyone to go to our websites for more in-depth bios, but just for some quick inter inter introductions. Wow, sorry. Professor David Hellerstein is a professor of clinical psychiatry at the Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons and director of the Depression Evaluation Service at the New York State Psychiatric Institute. He has numerous books and is currently researching psychedelic treatments of depression and other disorders. Dr. Francis Onyemba is a gastroenterologist and Columbia DC board member. She completed medical school at Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons prior to completing her internal medicine residency and a fellowship in GI motility and neurogastroenterology at Johns Hopkins Hospital. In 2019, she was selected into the Young Physician Leadership Scholars and Scholars Program by the American College of Gastroenterology for Leadership Development and Physician Advocacy. Her interests include health communications and innovative programs, practices within healthcare. And with that, I will turn it over to Francis. Hey, good evening, alumni and friends. Good evening, David. Oh, um, glad to be here. Thank you. It's, uh, I'm, my name is Francis Onyemba, as Nyako mentioned. It is my pleasure to join you all, our audience, tonight for a discussion with Dr. David Hellerstein. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Yeah. Okay, yes. wonderful. Um, Dr. Hellerstein, that intro doesn't fully do you justice, uh, but briefly, like she mentioned, you're a psychiatrist, you're a leader in the field of neuropsychiatry, um, and you graciously agreed to share your expertise and personal experience with us in the ever-changing, ever-challenging world of healing the mind. But before we get started, I have to do a little bit of housekeeping from all, for all those watching. Um, I will say one, this is a discussion for everyone. So at the bottom of your screen, you'll see the questions and answers tab. Please use that throughout the session and we will have a dedicated session to address all of the audience questions. The second issue or second point is that this is an informative educational session. We will probably discuss therapies, but it's not medical advice. Typically, when we have some of our clinically oriented discussions, I'll get a couple of questions that are seeking medical direction. Just keep in mind, this is educational. And then lastly, we do have alumni from various uh, universities and then schools within Columbia University. So we will have various levels of understanding about medicine. And I've asked Dr. Hellerstein to break down some concepts um, just for the lay person as well. So... David, as I said, welcome. Um, I will say again briefly that it seems to me that we're in a turning point in terms of public perception and psychiatric illnesses. And now we have gone from taboo to celebrities and athletes like Michael Phelps very publicly discussed their struggles with depression and endorsing mental health apps. But the understanding of your field has remained stagnant. Um, most people still think of it as just the couch. And now you've written this book called The Couch, The Clinic, The Scanner, Stories from Three Revolutionary Areas of the Mind, kind of bridging that gap very nicely to walk us through how the field has transformed over time and give us your personal accounts of your own transformation over the last decades. Um, you tell a lot of compelling personal anecdotes. I'm just hoping you can just start us out with a detail of how the field has evolved over the last half century. Um, so thanks, Francis. I'm so happy to be here today. And um, the audience I can't see, but I understand it's a pretty large audience. So I uh, hope this will be a fun talk. Um, so I, I was really, I guess, compelled to write the book because of personal experience of tumult and change. And the, uh, one of the readers of my book um, described it as a wild ride. And I think that kind of describes the changes in psychiatry over the past several decades. So I was kind of trying to capture the, the essence, sort of the lived experience of 
these types of changes as a way to illuminate the really profound um, paradigm shifts within our field. And it's different, I think, than say gastroenterology, cardiology, uh, other, other specialties of medicine where it's a pretty linear um, growth pattern and, and the past sort of informs the, the, the present and the future. And there's a fairly linear uh, kind of intellectual direction. And psychiatry has gone through really waves and paradigm changes and changes in practice and changes in understanding what's wrong with a person who's suffering, uh, how to approach their, their formulation of what's, how to describe the problem um, and how to try to come up with treatments. And the treatments are so different from the age of psychoanalysis, uh, being on the couch, which was the dominant model back from the 50s through the probably the early 80s to the DSM era, which we'll talk about more based on the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. And then the last couple of decades have been this emerging revolution of neurosciences approaches, which is very, very exciting, very chaotic, and it's not really easily discerned like how to apply that to patient care. Can you talk a little bit more about the three different eras that you mentioned and what they entailed? Sure. So um, the psychoanalytic era, when I was a resident at, uh, in the early 1980s at New York Hospital Payne Whitney Clinic in New York, um, the main uh, background or theory behind uh, psychiatric disorders and treatment was psychoanalytic. So the idea was you would um, talk to individual patients, you would meet with them for uh, many hours, several times a week. They would hopefully be on a couch lying down, free associating. And that was kind of the universal um, uh, approach to, if you want real treatment, the person should go into analysis. So that's what I trained in. And so the, there were other components to the training as well. I'm not trying to diminish it. It was a very strong department in a lot of areas, but the, the kind of main theme and theory was really psychoanalytic. So everybody had psychotherapy patients who did, they trained in intensive psychotherapy, they often went into their own personal psychotherapy and analysis. And it really was a way to transform how one looked at the world and also to work on one's own problems. And in a way, even residents who weren't interested in therapy were kind of coaxed into, or sometimes uh, a little bit more than coaxing, to go into their own personal therapy as a way to really understand how the field worked. So that was, I plunged into that full force. That was my residency. And then the DSM era came in, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which was the third edition came out in 1980 when I was just starting residency, but it became the predominant model for treatment. And so it's like a takeout menu. So you have a diagnosis, you have criteria part A, you have five out of nine criteria part A, criteria part B, part C. So it's like a cookbook and you can then make reliable diagnoses and then, oh, this person has this diet disorder, panic disorder, an eating disorder, major depression. And then the next step was, okay, we should have standardized treatments. And it was the total opposite of psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis didn't really play into any of the DSM treatment approaches. So those of us who had spent, we were like acolytes in a monastery almost, training in this very intense, almost religious approach to, to therapy, suddenly it's kind of thrown out the window and no, just count symptoms and give the person 10 weeks of evidence-based CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. So it was a real, real um, shift that, that, that uh, I think shook a lot of people up. Certainly our psychoanalytic supervisors felt very, I think, abandoned and lost and disrespected because their expertise, which was very, very hard won, was really not uh, particularly valued anymore. And in fact, it was like that was the old let's come in with the new so that was that was one phase so i went from the psychoanalytic type of training um which was never a very comfortable fit for me to jumping into the dsm era and then that to me was a very very exciting time because all these disorders were being identified you could have um agreement among two or more uh doctors who evaluated a patient this is what the person's problem is and then you could do something about it with evidence-based treatments that could help within a couple of months. So you could have evidence-based therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, interpersonal therapy, 
Uh, now we have DBT, uh, diagnostic di dialectic behavioral therapies become very common for people with personality issues, but also we had medications. And so this was, if you put yourself back in the mindset of the late 80s and early 90s, that was when uh, Prozac and the SSRIs first came out. And that was a very, very exciting time because you would see patients who had depression, panic symptoms, OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, other conditions, and they previously would, would have been told, well, you're going to need four times a week psychotherapy for five years or, or twice a week for three years. And we'll, we'll work on these issues and maybe you have mother issues or you know, uh, other kinds of issues about your connections to other people and you weren't parented properly. We'll work those, those things through and several years later, hopefully you'll be better. Well, it turned out a lot of those treatments didn't really help the, uh, those conditions, but the DSM treatments did. Um, the evidence-based therapies were effective. The SSRIs, there's a lot of debate these days about how effective like Prozac or other SSRIs are in depression. But at that point, it was this sort of miraculous uh, moment. So people came out of the woodwork seeking treatment. Um, we could help a lot of people. We developed in the um, hospitals that I worked in, the clinics I worked in, colleagues I worked with, many new, cool, interesting treatment approaches and provided data with different uh, um, randomized clinical trials and other kinds of studies. And it was really exciting. Um, I'll skip why it stopped being so exciting. Maybe we can come back to that. I just say the mm -hmm. word managed care. But, okay. <laughs> but then, so then more recently, what's happened has been the neuroscience era. And so when I came to Columbia to the New York State Psychiatric Institute in the year 2000, it was like this eye-opening experience because all these neuroscientists and other um, scientific researchers in a lot of different disciplines were studying the brain and its relation to psychiatric conditions. And this, I've been at Columbia for like 23 years, and it's, the revolution is only in its infancy. But you take the psychoanalytic stuff, you take the DSM stuff, boom, no, we have the neuroscience understanding, nerve, nerve cells, brain cells, synapses, brain networks, uh, neurogenesis, neuroplasticity. I'm throwing out all these words to come yeah. back to what they all mean, but suddenly our vocabulary totally changed. So when I wanted to tell the story, it was like, wow, this is a way to tell it through stories because um, through my stories in psychoanalytic training, my stories in working in an inner city hospital in the DSM revolutionary era, and now mm -hmm. my efforts to, to do research and change my practice based on what I've gleaned from neuroscience. Um, and to it's like three languages, three countries, right. three cultures, total um, uh, changes in mindset. I, I mean, it sounds like night and day, and as shocking as that is to the system for the practitioner or provider, like what response were you seeing from patients who all of a sudden, like you said, were spending four days a week in getting psychoanalysis to all of a sudden being told now that we're getting medications and, you know, so, so down the line, oh, now we need to scan your brain, et cetera. What was the response from patients that you noticed? Um, so it's very uh, variable. So there are definitely still people who are interested in psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis actually has made a certain bit of a comeback, which is interesting. Uh, but I would say that the people who'd been in intensive psycho psychoanalytic therapy who suddenly saw, oh, here's a medication that can make me feel better in a matter of weeks, or here's a therapy approach that could make me help me change my behaviors and accomplish more of my goals. I think a lot of them felt relief but also, I think, confusion, uh, because while I was, these are people in authority who told me this is an approach that was very helpful. Now they're switching gears and saying, no, do that instead. It's the, not the exact opposite. It's still therapy. It's still working with a compassionate therapist and doctor, but the approach is very different. And now, same thing with neuroscience, which is even more um, confusing. So patients have, I think, um, and many people just go to what they're comfortable with. So it's like, oh, no, no, I read Freud when I was in college, so I believe in the dreams and the unconscious, so I'll find a Freudian therapist. Or I took a CBT class in, in you know, graduate school, so I'm going to find a CBT therapist, which is sort of more in the DSM model. Or these days, a lot of people are, well, I'm learning neuroscience. I'm a 
neuroscience grad student or I was a neuroscience major in college. And I learned a lot about nerve, nerve ne neural networks and um, the default mode network and neuroplasticity and the way that the psychedelics or ketamine can reset neural circuits. So I'm gonna go with that. So it's kind of like you got almost political parties in a way sort of going to what their um, safe, safe zone is in a way. But if you're this practitioner, you're trying to like be a traffic cop. It's like, well, who, what's best for who? It's, it's really exciting and also kind of baffling. Yeah, you talked a little bit about how the transition when DSM-3 happens kind of changed thing, the practice now to, I, I think the term was drive-through psychotherapy. Is that kind of what you were discussing and you <laughs> talked about some of the... Well, yeah. so this was the, the down, so I can maybe say some things about the, what happened with the DSM <clears throat> yeah. was it, it helped psychiatry become accepted into the mainstream of medicine. So uh, when I was working at this urban clinic, that was great. We talked to all the other doctors and other specialties. We had our own clinic space. We, we were involved with a lot of hospital-wide initiatives. But then when managed care came, it was the dollar was being the dollar was being sorry a little background noise. the dollar was being split between different specialties and psychiatry didn't get very much money and so then managed care came and started making cutbacks so the DSM model kind of it worked very well but it was underfunded and what happened was more patients per per doctor per therapist shorter visits, more group visits instead of individual visits. There was also um, uh, limits on numbers of visits. And it was all to save money, which was great, except then you saw that the heads of the managed care companies were often making tens or hundreds of millions of dollars in their own personal salary. Um, I don't know if that's happened in any other parts of medicine, but you can tell me. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So it was a perverse incentive. So the treatments that that we had, I think were very effective and continue to be helpful and effective. Uh, we wanna make them more effective, but the, the kind of legs were cut, cut under underneath the system. And I actually think that, um, that uh, now that we're trying to recover from COVID, the fact that there was dismantling of so much of the outpatient mental health system a decade or two decades ago has really hurt the ab availability of, of therapy and other psych Theatric interventions. So we paid the price by kind of demolishing a lot of the infrastructure. But it wasn't like it was a bad treatment approach. It was sure. just that it was cut. At least that, right. that's my perspective. Um, in the book, when you first start talking about psychoanalysis and the way that it was delivered to the public, you kind of describe this um, it sounds like, you know, your Upper West Side, posh clinic, you're lying on a couch, and in some ways to me sounds like something that is a little like, exclusive and might, might be um, difficult to access for the masses. Did you see when DSM became widely adopted that that changed the way that patients could access uh, oh, care? I think it was for, fantastic you know? improvement. Yeah. So I think that was... One of the things, psychoanalysis has had a major impact on culture and in a way it, it's helped shape our American and Western European culture for better or worse, um, but it's fantastically impractical, it's like classic psychoanalysis to provide to the millions of people with psychiatric disorders. Even yeah. assuming it was a very effective treatment for say depression, most people can't afford the time, the money, there's not a therapist who can do psychoanalytic therapy. So it, it's a, it has limited public health reach in a sense, although the way it, it became more available was psych, psychodynamic psychotherapy. So people could see a therapist once a week and could be covered by their health plan. So classic psychoanalysis is very impractical. Just regular psychotherapy with a therapist, that kind of was um, a, a much broader ap applicable approach. Um, the DSM era was fantastically, ha has been potentially fantastically um, enabling and uh, potentially could have uh, reached many wider groups of people. So we, in my um, 
time running a, a clinic, we worked with pretty much every um, socioeconomic, uh, cultural, ethnic, racial, sexual, any kind of population that you could imagine. And we had many different uh, specialists in different areas. We had support groups. Um, we did um, programs for people with co coexisting schizophrenia and substance abuse, which was un very neglected and still is, if you look at what happens on the subways in New York City uh, area. But um, so it was actually, and, and also the DSM showed that across many different cultures, nations, backgrounds, uh, economic ranges, that disorders are very common and have a huge impact on on functioning and lifespan and productivity. So it was a, it had a huge impact. Um, I think the the limitations uh, are many, but a lot of them were economic um, economically driven. Which it's interesting that you say that and how DSM allowed you to kind of standardize diagnoses across cultures because when when I used to think about it, I thought the way that we think about psychiatric illness and mental health and mood disorders is very culturally dependent, right? Like your sense of what is normal as a normal reaction to something or a normal feeling in some ways was shaped by what you grew up around. But when DSM came out and now with uh, more of the brain imaging and more of the neuropsychiatric objective measures, you're seeing that that's not the case. Well, I think that that the interesting thing about the DSM, the, one of the good things about that era was then you could say, well, how does depression express itself? I mean, is depression even a valid condition in different yeah. cultures? Or what are symptoms are most common among people who live in this area of the world or come from that culture or have other different differences from the kind of um, American, mostly American European population that it was developed on? So, but that's that's not a necessarily a flaw of the DSM. It's sort of saying like you could then refine it and make it a more effective approach. Um, the um, the neuroscience, if we're if we're talking about that, neuroscience does not make diagnoses at this point. I mean, this is one of the even though we've leapt with both feet into this new era, we don't have the ability to scan someone's brain and say you have OCD or you have depression. Mm -hmm. We just don't have that. So. That's um, a major limitation from us actually being able to say um, that there's a precise or um, uh, personalized approach from a scientific basis that would help this individual. There are people working in that area, but it, many people are doing research in that area, but it's, we're nowhere near that stage for the vast majority of people. Okay. So can you tell me a little bit more about neuropsychiatry and how some of the objective measures are being used? Like F MRIs and PET, we know, can kind of uh, help look at some of the pathways that might be involved with diseases or disorders. How is it currently being used? So it's really, um, um, so the, you know, the, the title of my book is The Couch, the Clinic, and the Scanner. And a lot of people say, okay, I get the couch, I get the clinic. What's the scanner? And I said, well, the scanner is, is kind of two things. One is the instruments that we use in, in psychiatry now. So the MRI scanner, the PET scanner, SPECT scanner, there's a lot of machinery that is used to um, investigate the brain. It's not only its structure, but its function, its connections. But the, the, the kind of double meaning of it to me is that we are scanners. As, as the psychiatrists who are interested in neuroscience, we're scanning the literature, we're trying to put things together. We're saying, I read this study, I read that study. So actually it's sort of the, it's, it's an age of exploration in which we're trying to actually make sense of this massive uh, intellectual enterprise of neuroscience and trying to see, well, how does that relate to human life, mind, and, and suffering? And so if you, if you talk to different um, psychiatrists who are interested sort of with the neuroscience minded kind of hat on, you'll find that there are many different ways that people, such people have kind of come up with models that are influenced by neuroscience. So one person might like um, uh, the head of the National Institute of Mental Health, Josh Gordon, brilliant researcher and, and leader, he, he talks about himself as a circuit psychiatrist. 
So there are circuits in the brain that are common to different um, disorders and that seem to show abnormal, uh, abnormal function in say depression and anxiety disorders and other conditions. So they would be kind of circuit scanner psychiatrists in the sense of circuit psychiatrists. There's other neuroscience minded people who are more interested in attachment or reward circuitry or learning. So we don't have a single model. The DSM was kind of a nice neat package, a single model. We're really in an age of exploration. So you could say, well, what, what do I do in my practice? Um, how do I think of neuroscience in a way that is logical and digestible? So I, I basically, and I talked about this in my previous book, um, Heal Your Brain, but I think of it at, that we need to embrace the idea of the brain as an organ that we want to keep healthy and that it's often not healthy in people who have psychiatric disorders and that the disorders themselves may lead to a worsening of the brain, brain's health. So some of the concepts that I think are really interesting would be is our um, like neuroplasticity. So the brain is constantly reshaping and changing itself through life. So if you're, uh, and, and disorders seem to have a negative impact on plasticity. They shrink the brain. Um, they decrease the number of connections between brain cells. Um, and so one of the kind of principles of neuropsychiatry as, as I see it in this new phase is trying to enhance the brain's health and eating, you know, diet, exercise, sleep, and other kinds of health interventions, things your mother would tell you to do to take care of your general health. Those are things that generally are helpful for, um, for brain health. They help uh, neurotrophic factors or brain growth cell factors, and they decrease inflammation, which has, is very common among people with psychiatric uh, conditions to have sort of a highly inflamed um, body system. I mean, you're a GI specialist, right? I'm sure you see many people who have inflammation throughout their bodies, their gut, their, their other tissues, but also their brain. And so, um, so anyway, so that I, I see those as, as important components. And then one of the circuits that um, I think is, is very common to have abnormalities in psychiatric disorders is one called the default mode network. And that's kind of a mouthful as a description of a network, but it's, it's brain um, centers that become active when your mind is at rest. So if you lie down, you close your eyes, you let your mind wander, the default mode network is kind of a daydreaming network. And so people who are, have um, depression, anxiety disorders, panic disorder, um, post-traumatic stress disorder, have elevated activity of the default mode network, and they actually have trouble turning it off. So this is, to me, kind of a mind-boggling thing that underneath these very different DSM diagnoses, there seems to be something in common that people have elevated default mode network activity. And then you, you can start asking questions, well, is there a way to affect that uh, activity? Is that maybe Part of, is that a cause or an effect of the, of the disorder? And there's really interesting studies about mindfulness, meditation, um, the breathing, other kinds of things that can be used to help people control their default mode network and decreases activity, uh, but also antidepressant medicines seem to have that effect too. So I, I'm, I'm giving you kind of a long answer, <laughs> but, no, but it... It's, it's, it connects these very diverse and seemingly unrelated disorders, then maybe there's some common brain circuitry underlying many of them. I'm uh, dying for a little more detail. For us with biology or neuroscience backgrounds, this default mode network, if you were to map it, which parts of the brain would it map to? Um, it's part of the, uh, the singular cortex, enter singulate. It's um, connected to the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex. So it's sort of connects the kind of higher brain and the sort yeah. of anxiety and sort of uh, information processing parts of the brain. Um, and uh, it's, um, I mean, that's, the, that's only one of many networks. It's, I'm picking on that, that's yeah. my favorite network, 
<laughs> there's at least you know five or six other major reward networks and salience networks and, and those kinds of things. But I, the, I guess the point being, and this is similar to what Josh Gordon, the head of National Institute of Mental Health has written about, that thinking about the activities of these different brain systems and these different networks is just so different from where well, you have three symptoms of anxiety and four symptoms of depression, and you therefore have these two diagnoses and they're different. It's like, no, actually there's probably underlying circuit issues. We can't individually diagnose that for you, but we have a concept and we're trying to refine that. And uh, we're trying to then, the researchers are trying to do treatments that show specific brain network changes and activity changes. And it's a slog, it's a long process to do that, but there's been some interesting work in that area. And the clinicians who are the scanners and the, the neuroscience-minded psychiatrists are trying to apply that in, in clinical practice. And interestingly, the treatments that they then come up with are very different than the DSM era treatments. And those were different than the psychoanalytic treatments. So it's, it's a, that's what I'm saying. It's a, it's a very tumultuous um, time. I see that. Um, for those of a, of for those who are joining us a little bit later on, I just want to remind everybody that there is a question and answer box where you can submit questions for Dr. Hellerstein, and we will get to them um, shortly. I just I was hoping that you could touch a little bit upon precision medicine and psychiatry. Kind of what advancements have been made in that direction? Um, so that's one of the kind of um, uh, large. Uh, scientific challenges. And I think that we're at the very beginning of that. So there's, um, I, can, I can give you a couple of examples, but there's researchers who have looked at, if you say, well, take a big group of people with depression. And if you then do all kinds of scans and biological measures, can you divide that group out or look at their symptoms? Can you divide, subdivide that group into different groups of people, sort of subgroups? And this group might respond to this treatment, that group might respond to that treatment. So one example is um, some people who are depressed have a, a profound uh, loss of enjoyment or pleasure, something called anhedonia. Um, and there's some, some medications that look like they're more effective for people with that particular kind of symptom. Um, so that's, that's one interesting example. Another example I write about this in, in my book, The Couch, the Clinic, and the Scanner, is that there are researchers who are studying um, um, brains of people with severe disorders and are able to actually determine what kind of gene abnormalities they have and then can come up with specific medications that could potentially uh, reverse or uh, otherwise uh, limit the effects of those abnormalities. So one of the researchers in that area is named Sander Marks. He's at Columbia, and he just founded a, a very large center with, with other Columbia colleagues. And what they do is they take, they look at populations of people who have um, very high levels of um, mental and physical illnesses as a result of being very inbred. So if you look at the... Mm populations like the Amish and Mennonites and some other populations there, they keep very um, much separated from outside um, communities and they tend to marry people who are part of their communities. And so there's a lot of um, kind of concentration of specific genes in those, those populations. They started with very small numbers and then they grow over time to relatively large communities. They also keep very good, a lot of these communities, very good genealogical records. So then you could say, well, here's this um, uh, family of many generations. And you can say, well, this family member had seizure disorder. This one had schizophrenia. That one had heart disease of a particular kind. So what Sandra, So we've known these kinds of things in psychiatry for many, you know, many, many decades that there's conditions that run in families and genes have been uh, people try to identify genes uh, with me medium success, but what he's able to do is take 
uh, little swabs of the inside of people's mouths and take the cells, the skin cells essentially from the inside of the mouth, put them in solution, make them go back to um, stem cells and then regrow them as um, make them to so-called differentiate or grow into brain cells. And then he takes these little brain cells and he puts them in a, in a warm bath and puts in nutrients and they start to develop into a brain. So this is the last chapter of my book was talking about floating brains and also magic mushrooms and, and yeah. so on. But the, um, the idea is that he can then take the, the uh, cells from the person who has a disorder and also their close family members and, and grow them into brains. And it's not just certain brain cells, it's layers of brain cells that are connected like actual brains. And so he can then look at specific effects of different drugs on those, on those brain cells. So that's kind of the ultimate of precision medicine. If you can right. then find the gene that's abnormal, find a drug that has a, a helpful effect on that, or maybe do genetic repair, and then basically um, potentially effectively treat these people with an individualized treatment and potentially at some point, maybe even um, repair the genes. So that's a little space age. That's very, very small numbers of people. Not but ready for exciting. prime time, but, but super excited, right? Yeah, very exciting. Uh, you talked about magic mushrooms. Okay. So that's a perfect yeah. segue into psychedelics, which are all the rage right now. I know in February, Australia announced that they would approve MDMA, which is the ingredient for ecstasy and molly, uh, later on this year for therapeutic use. And there are a lot of different feelings about that, as I'm sure you can imagine. You, my understanding is that in your, uh, in your work as the director for the Depression Evaluation Services, you've worked with uh, psilocybin quite a bit. And I'm hoping that you could give us a little bit of an overview about how maybe psilocybin specifically works, um, why all of a sudden we're seeing this kind of push to reintroduce uh, substances that had previously been banned. So, yeah, I think it's, it's a really, really fascinating question and it raises um, even more questions. And I'll, I'll explain why in a second, but my group, the Depression Evaluation Service, We've been working with um, uh, psilocybin since about uh, 2019, and we were part of the largest study uh, for treatment-resistant depression that was published uh, last fall in the New England Journal. We also published a, just published a small study, Dr. Frank Schneier and I, uh, and our group with um, psilocybin for treating body dysmorphic disorders. So that's people who have sort of imagined ugliness and keep ruminating and obsessing about how their bodies or often their faces or heads don't look right. And so um, uh, it's a fascinating area because it's a type of drug that causes a very intense uh, response and seems to have, both, it causes a trip sometimes in a spiritual or mystical experience, but in terms of brain networks, it seems to have a profound effect on brain connections, and activity, and for reasons that I think are just not understood yet, a only a few doses seem to lead to lasting changes in these networks. So to me, that's, forgive the term, mind-boggling. How can that be that one or two doses of, yeah. of, of one of these compounds would change uh, brain activity in a lasting way? Um, so there's also these, uh, there's a huge social movement around rescheduling, uh, decriminalizing and um, otherwise uh, promoting the use of, of these compounds. So I'm a uh, clinical trials, clinical therapeutics researcher. So my interest is really how can we understand these compounds? How can we work with them best if they're going to be useful for people with psychiatric uh, conditions uh, and illnesses? And what's, how can we evaluate their safety properly? Are they risky um, or not and for whom? And what's the best way to, to if, if, assuming that they do have um, benefit and they go through the FDA approval process, then what's the best way to roll them out? Because 
similar to psychoanalysis, very expensive, very time consuming. Mm -hmm. Well, is that going to happen if the psychedelics also become legal? Is it only going to be the, the people with a lot of resources who are going to have access or is there going to be kind of more equitable use? Um, so there's, there's a multitude of issues that, that are coming up. But if I'm going to focus on the, the piece that's to me most interesting in, in terms of the, how does it affect back to the theme of our, um, our kind of my book and our talk, how, how does it affect our understanding of the mind? Because the psychoanalytic model, the DSM model, and now the neuroscience model, each of them is imperfect. Each of them has major strengths and really major weaknesses, but what do, where do the psychedelics fit in? And to me, that's one of the really interesting questions, because if you think about one aspect of psychedelics is people um, go back, they talk to their dead grand grandfather, they talk to their, they experience contact with their spirit animal, animals. I mean, they're, they're pretty, I can't imagine saying that to an audience, <laughs> general audience, but you know, I talked to patients like, what was your spirit animal, animal that you were talking to? It's like, I can't believe I'm, you know. That's the topic of conversation. That's a, of a, a serious <laughs> topic of conversation. And yet this is something that is, is so does this go to sort of the, the power of the unconscious mind and certainly tra working through trauma, re-experiencing early losses. That is very much something that psych psychedelics have been used for. And MDMA is, as a type of psychedelic very much so with trauma. So does it kind of validate the psycho psychoanalytic model or does it maybe validate the DSM model? Cause all these different, they're being used for depression, panic disorder, OCD, body dysmorphic disorder, trauma. Well, maybe it, it shows that these diagnoses have something to them because you can relieve them presumably with the psychedelics or is it a, does it some, say something about the neuroscience model? So the, the one of the, there's a uh, increasing number of studies for looking at the brain effects of psychedelics, and it looks like they cause um, radical effects on brain connections and brain activity, and probably act to restructure restructure networks. And a lot of people with psychiatric disorders seem to be in a broken record kind of situation. The same circuits the default mode network or other circuits fire over and over again. They obsess, they ruminate, they can't turn their minds off at night when they try to sleep. And so maybe these drugs are things that break these overconnected uh, kind of loops and help people um, think and act more and connect to people more kind of adaptively. So they seem to have a, when I mentioned neuroplasticity, they seem to have a effect of enhancing brain plasticity that um, could maybe validate the neuroscience model, or is it going to bring everything together? So it's a, it's a, it's a really fun time, and um, it's really, um, I think, giving a shot in the arm to a lot of uh, psychiatric research because so many people, if in the if researchers in the field, if you talk to them, they can see relevance for that type of treatment that um, could help them explore areas of, that they're passionate about uh, studying. Wonderful. There is uh, so much on the horizon, and it's interesting to me how the psychedelics are bringing us back right, a little bit to the unconscious mind and forward with neuroplasticity. It brings me to one question. I'm running out of time for my questions, but I have two that I just have to get okay. in okay. last minute. So it brings me to your uh, the very beginning of your book and the preface. You have a statement that I'm hoping you can expand on a little bit for me, but you ask a question to open your book and you say, who owns the mind? And you kind of talk about how there's been a progression of models to explain our thoughts and motives and yearnings. And first the priests and prophets were the ones who kind of explained our, our, our minds. And then philosophers use logic to explain our minds and then psychiatrists. And we're looking at that historic trend is it possible that psychiatrists would be pushed aside eventually? And if so, by whom? <laughs> um, well, I think the, the nature of um, paradigm shifts is that they're often very unpredictable. And so that's, I think, inherently a difficult question to, to answer. I think that the, the 
the there's a lot of neuroscientists who are not psychiatrists. So I think that neuroscientists are kind of becoming the custodians of the mind because there's so many, the kinds of things that I've mentioned about neuroscience are just tiny little portions of a few areas of neuroscience, which is this vastly complicated uh, an amazing series of, of fields. So I'm guessing it's the neuroscientists, um, okay. but you know, it could be the gurus and the spiritual leaders too. I mean, it's, it's again, when I talk about spirit animals and mystical experiences, when I went to Stanford Medical School back in the, in the late 70s, I, it was, those are not phrases that I would, would have imagined using in the context of providing treatment for people with psychiatric disorders. Okay, one last question from me, and then we're going to open it for the rest of the audience. Um, I don't know how many people know this, but you are actually strongly involved with the narrative medicine course at Columbia University, um, and narrative medicine is a field of medicine that was started by Rita Sharon at Columbia. I think for me, as I'm reading your book, uh, that interest, that uh, interest in literature and narrative and how that there's interplay with how we are um, interacting with our parent, patients and managing our patients is obvious. Like it's, your book isn't written like a documentary or a typical history book. There's, there are anecdotes and there are characters and there's imagery. Can you just tell us a little bit about what narrative medicine is and the impact that it's having on medical education? Um, well, I think narrative or medicine. Practice, even. Yeah. So narrative medicine is, um, and Rita is a, uh, been a real inspiration at Columbia for, for a number of decades. And I've been teaching in one of her courses, teaching pre-medical, pre, pre-clinical medical students. So first and second year medical students for, since I came in, in the early 20, 2000s. Um, narrative, I think, is essential to medicine because uh, physicians and other healthcare workers talking to patients and family, um, you have to tell a story. You have to describe what's, what's the problem, uh, how do you explain what's going on? What's the prognosis? How are you going to treat it? And um, how does that, is there going to be a story of recovery? Is it a story of loss? Is it a story of, of end of life? Um, and those stories are really essential. When I was a, 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 a kid, both of my parents were physicians. My father was a cardiologist and an and a, um, exercise researcher. And my mom was a pediatrician. And so I learned about medicine from their stories. And we would go down to the, my mom's pediatric clinic in inner city Cleveland, my dad's exercise lab and on the wards at, at Western Reserve University Hospital. And we'd see his patients with him. But there's always at the end of the day, well, what happened? What was going on? How do you explain it? Um, and so it's both how medicine, the culture of medicine passes from one generation to the next, but also how do patients and doctors communicate? And I think one of the key competencies, if we use our jargon of medicine, is narrative competency or communications competency that people, especially now, doctors are being trained in such complex, rigorous scientific areas. How do you translate that to the patient and have a dialogue where it's meaningful and addresses the person's uh, main concerns? And what's the best way to get feedback when something is very technical or overwhelming or confusing. So I think that we come back to stories and stories I think are central to medicine. And so that's, my book is really a series collection of stories. So a patient who fell in love with me, uh, a couple who I treated the whole family, they got better, but their, their marriage could not be saved. Uh, my own psychoanalytic therapy, uh, there was a patient who was saved just by mistake because we kicked her out of the clinic for very good reasons, but a doctor by mistake let her in and gave her a new treatment and basically rescued her to have new, to be able to start life again. So it's really stories. And now there's the stuff about the, the floating brains and the mushrooms. And so we're, we're in this world of stories. And I think trying to say that medicine should go beyond stories is, is not a good idea. I think it's actually, we should embrace storytelling, not as a way to get around truth, but as a way to eliminate it. I completely agree. And for those of you who, who were joining a little bit later, the book that he's referring to is his newest publication by CU Press, which is The Cough 
sorry, the couch, the clinic, and the scanner, stories from three revolutionary eras of the mind. And I, I wish I had the jacket with me. Right uh, now. I have it. I have yes, it. You have I just, it. I just want to point out to the Columbia audience, it has the Columbia blue. <laughs> Close enough. I'm so glad you brought it because I was uh, like, oh, I know, I know, I know I should have it with me and I don't have it. So thank you for showing it sure. for us. Um, we're going to go ahead and switch over to audience questions. There are several, so I'm going to try to get through as many as I can. Um, and of course, this is not medical advice. So the first question comes from Chris Harding, who says, um, uh, the last I heard, there are greater than 104 genes connected to schizophrenia. Are genetic tests ineffective for people with schizophrenia? Um, so... There's, um, this is one of the frontiers of genetic testing and um, the, the most common genetic uh, testing is actually around medication response. Uh, so there's what's called pharmacogenetic testing and um, there's several companies that have marketed this type of testing and the psychiatric experts who have reviewed that type of testing have said it's really not ready for prime time. And that's a much simpler kind of testing than the hundred and so genes that might be associated with, with the psychiatric illness itself. Because the, the pharmacogenetic testing looks at the um, um, genes for enzymes that, that would metabolize medicines and break them down. And so that's much easier to measure. And even for those tests, which are you can get measurable results. Um, they're only useful for a certain population of patients. They're not like, oh, my pediatrician should definitely order, order, order that for my kid before he or she's even gotten treatment. Um, so the, the genetic testing for schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, um, I, I'm a little skeptical that it would be particularly helpful for any one person to know. I mean, I guess it's worth knowing the same way people sign up for 23andMe and get their gene types read out or find their relatives. But it's not likely to really, at this point, um, help you choose the right treatment, which is really, eventually, that's what we would want to be able to say, well, this is the right medication or some other treatment. Okay. We have another question from Dr. Deborah Myers, who asks, has the anatomical structure of what we consider the mind been localized with neuroscience? And I guess that touches a little bit on what you mentioned with the networks. I'll let you answer. Um, great question. Um, I, I think that um, I, I view it as the mind, brain, body. I don't think the whole mind is just in the, in the part above your neck. Uh, so I, I think that the, 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 and Francis and I were talking about this in a previous meeting, I always remember my um, um, embryology studies. There's three layers, the ectoderm, endoderm, and mesoderm of the little embryo when it's first developing. And ectoderm is skin, and it, 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 the, the brain is ectoderm, the gut is ectoderm, your skin is ectoderm, and the nerves and, and uh, receptor systems are throughout uh, all those tissues. And so I, I'm, I don't know if I'm answering the question right, but I think we are, we are our minds. I mean, uh, and our bodies are exquisite systems for giving feedback to our brains. And the, the, uh, it's not just what's going on in our skull, but um, I, I, I don't think there's a um, uh, uh, single answer to it's in that part of your uh, you know, your, your frontal cortex. I think it's the, the network connectivity throughout the entire brain. Um, and I think it's an emergent property of, of a very large, complicated uh, uh, circuit. But I, I would be thrilled if some brilliant neuroscientist could say, no, it's right there near the right temporal lobe. And that's, that's the, the location of the mind. But I'm doubtful that that's going to be the, the way of... of um, of research. Wonderful. Dr. Dubin asks, is there any role for hypnosis in mental health treatment? Um, so, oh, and um, so uh, I, I'm not up on the latest in hypnosis, uh, but I think that 
it's a uh, um, it's it's I mean one of the DSM advantages of DSM psychiatry was developing methodology for testing different kinds of treatments, and so there there is some evidence for um, for hypnosis, um, but what do you compare it to? So I think you want to uh, have com comparison or control conditions that are valid conditions and also that are relatively blinded. Um, so it's, it's not an easy thing to do, but you could, if you're thinking more of in a neuroscience way, could you do hypnotic interventions and try to change uh, brain network activity? That would be cool. I don't know if anybody's done it, uh, but it, it wouldn't be an outrageous thing to do if somebody wanted to do it, just the same way you could say, well, I, I can give you an example. We're, we're working with a group, um, Yuval Muria is a Columbia uh, professor who does PTSD research, and he's doing a study of transcendental meditation for PTSD amongst veterans. And he's comparing that to a different uh, kind of psychotherapy. And so that's an example. TM is sort of um, related in some way to, to hypnosis because people are putting themselves in an altered state. And I think the psychedelics make us more respectful of the power of those states. There's definitely research on uh, yoga and meditation um, and other kinds of uh, intense practices having effects on brain, um, brain function. So I think it's a reasonable question. I don't know what the answer would be. Thank you. We have a couple of questions about AI. Uh, some, uh, someone asked, what are the promises and dangers of AI and AGI in psychiatric research and clinical care? Um, it's such an interesting area that um, the, um, it's almost any social conversation or conversation with peers in, in medicine these days, that the topic of what's AI gonna do, it comes up. So the, um, I was teaching some medical students in my narrative medicine class today, and I said, we were having this conversation about um, the burden of uh, record keeping in medicine and how people are running around trying to finish their epic notes so they can go home and you know, not get a lot of uh, violations from you know, notices on, in their emails about missing chart work. I said, well, the moment you can tell AI to write your chart notes for you, then I think we've got something useful if you're a doctor. But um, I think in, in um, psychiatry, especially with uh, kind of life, lifelike chatbots and uh, real-time uh, dialogue, you certainly can imagine that a lot of therapists are potentially worried if they're going to be put out of work. Um, you could definitely, uh, you could customize your therapist to be um, the gender or personality type or appearance that you would like to, that you might not find in your real life therapist. So maybe more patient. So the, 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 um, I think there's reasons to be concerned. Um, uh, I think there's also safety concerns too, because um, AI is not necessarily bound to ethical uh, standards. All right. Um, we have an anonymous attendee who says, I completed my neurology residency in 1984. Our residency director, who's still teaching, told us that neurologists were to become the internists who specialized in the central nervous system and that psychiatrists were properly conceived subspecialists who were experts in the limbic lobe. Do you see the fields moving back more closely as the neuroscience model takes hold in myriad ways? Um, I, I certainly hope so, because I think it's interesting, like Francis, when you and I were talking, you're, you're specializing in um, organs mostly below the neck. Uh, I'm specializing in organs mostly above the neck, but they have the same receptors and the same tissues and the same, you know, the structure is different, but they're highly connected. With neurologists, psychiatrists and neurologists are dealing with the same organ. We pretty much use the same drugs. I'm often treating people where I was about to prescribe such and such medicine, and then it turns out the neurologist prescribed the same thing, maybe for a slightly different symptom, but the, um, the toolbox and the organ we're talking about are, are the same. Um, um, and um, I think also we have similar 
um, concerns. Uh, when I uh, talk to neurologists or, or people with, who focus on Parkinson's disease or people with Parkinson's disease, they're very much focused on a lot of the same um, issues about neuroplasticity, exercise, uh, mindfulness, relaxation, um, cognitive functioning, cognitive enhancement, things that people with depression, anxiety disorders, and other psychiatric conditions um, are also focused on. So I think their practice is very much overlapping. Um, but we're very distinct groups. Our training is very distinct. So we focus more on, um, uh, yeah, I'd say limbic is a good, is a good summary, but the um, amygdala hippocampus, um, uh, other kinds of brain center, but prefrontal cortex, uh, frontal cortex, um, the, you know, the neurologists focus much more on motor centers, sensory centers. So there's de definitely, we've got our parts that we claim and you got your parts that you claim. Thank you. I'm, I'm gonna take a question since you talked about kind of the overlap with the gut and the brain. And, and there has been, as we talked about, some more buzz about the potential role of the gut microbiome in mood disorders. And specifically part of that thought process is that some of the bacteria that live within the gut can produce or break down products that affect the nervous system and overall inflammation, which as you mentioned, plays a role in mood disorders. Is that something that you're seeing in your field? I know there had been um, there was a study going on looking at maybe the effects of what happens if we do fecal transplants in patients with depression. Do we end up changing something along those? Are you seeing that discussed at all, or is this pretty still kind of on the periphery? Um, I think the well, the there's psychiatrists like Drew Ramsey is a psychiatrist in our department who's very much focused on um, diet, and he's a big fan of kale, uh, the <laughs> kale farmer himself. But, but the, so that I think it's become very much the mainstream of psychiatric practice to say that people should be avoiding highly processed foods and should be adhering to a kind of more Mediterranean type of diet. Um, there was just a paper that uh, came out showing that uh, foods like French fries um, create chemicals that can enhance the risk of depression and anxiety. So there's, I think, that's very, very widely applicable because we all eat French fries, probably too many. Um, but the diets that people eat um, uh, have a big impact on psychiatric uh, mental functioning, mental state, not mental disorders. And so that becomes a huge public health issue. Um, there are also studies showing um, that, um, um, as you said, fecal transplants or um, uh, other kinds of um, uh, like lactobacillus kinds of, um, you know, dietary supplements can help mood disorders. They haven't really taken the field by storm. I think it's more, this is just generally good for people to, to have better nutrition. If once they presented with a psychiatric disorder, you should look over all their health issues, in, including nutrition and exercise and inflammation doesn't doesn't particularly care if it's the brain or the bowel or the heart or the um, muscles or skeletal system. Inflammation affects everything. Right. And maybe, you know, a hundred years down the line, it'll be the gastroenterologist and no one would have seen it coming and they'll be the ones <laughs> <laughs> Could be. who have the model. <laughs> Just kidding. I, I don't <laughs> I don't see that happening. Uh, moving on to our next questions. We have a couple of questions about uh, scans. Someone asks, can we, can you see what effect a particular drug has on a particular part of the brain? Is that something that we're currently using imaging studies to look at? And another person asks, along with scans like diffusion tensor imaging, there is uh, me metabolemics. Can the two be used together to understand disease? Um, yes, but none of those are useful on an individual basis yet. They're not ready for prime time. So um, there have been, um, like we did a number of studies with um, antidepressant medication treating people with chronic depression compared to antidepressant versus placebo and looked at brain, their brains. This was with MRI scans pre and post treatment. 
and we were able to show that for the group treated with antidepressant medicine compared to the group treated with placebo, there were changes, for instance, in the default mode network where default mode network, which is was associated with rumination and obsession and negative thoughts about oneself, the activity of the default mode network decreased from a high level to the to a level of a non-depressed group for the people who were treated with antidepressant medicine. But for the people treated with placebo, it didn't change. But that's a group of people. You can't just say, oh, my friend went into the scanner and they did a scan before and after treatment and she was shown to be, you know, her circuits were improved. It's, it's not, you know, her default mode network went down three standard deviations. No, you're not going to see that in an individual you will see that in a group of 20 or 50 or 100 patients compare one treatment compared to another. Um, there's a lot of different kinds of scans that are that are used. So I'm not really an expert on metalomics, about metabolomics, so I can't really comment on that, but I think we're using every tool, reasonable tool to try to capture the, the brain effects of disorder and of treatments. Okay. Uh, Barb asks, would you say that electroconvulsive therapy intersects with the neuroscience model? Um, yeah, I think it's actually, electroconvulsive therapy goes way back. It actually, many, many decades ago, and it was a staple of treatment even when I was a resident in the early 1980s. It's become a lot more sophisticated and less um, invasive because, you um, People uh, have their muscle activity blocked so they don't injure themselves. And also the, the focus of this brain uh, electrical stimulus is very limited now, so they have less memory effects. But I think it was the original, essentially the, the original treatment to try to reset brain networks. And that's why if you read the psych psychedelic writers like Michael Pollan um, talking about uh, how to change your mind, his, that book, there's very much the idea of, can you reset these abnormally functioned brain circuits? And so I think that ECT, um, it's, it's not the most commonly used treatment, but it's sort of the model for the kind of treatments that people are, are using now. So ketamine is one, it's anesthetic that people are given IV. Uh, it's not approved by the FDA, but it is used um, IV um, to try to reset brain circuits. The psychedelics, same thing, that's one of the theories of how they work. We'll see if that's if that really plays out. Okay. Uh, we have a, several more questions to try to get to. I'm going to ask a question about the um, let's see. A question about the psychedelics. Um, so we are currently in the middle of an opioid crisis. And in that, we took an uh, ingredient from an illicit drug, heroin, and have used it therapeutically for patients um, and have run into unforeseen circumstances that we're now trying to combat. Knowing that psychedelics were previous or schedule one um, with concern for abuse potential, are there, is there anything that we've learned from this current opioid crisis that could help avoid um, future pitfalls, large-scale pitfalls, if psychedelics start to become approved. So, so I, yeah, I think we've learned the the perils of um, illicit and uh, unregulated drugs and fentanyl and other forms of of opiates that are just really horribly toxic, and the death rate has just been huge. Um, it is obviously a, a warning about rescheduling drugs. Um, that said. <clears throat> um, the studies that are being done now are looking pretty carefully at safety, and um, the, there is a um, pretty large literature that shows that people who use psychedelics tend not to start to use other drugs, and they tend not to abuse psychedelics. So it's, it's actually one of the, to me, one of the really interesting things about psychedelics is that of the drugs who are, that are Schedule I, um, that are, and the DEA calls a drug schedule one if it has no medically approved use. Of those drugs, um, pretty much all of them are addictive, or if you use one of them to access, you're likely to use other ones. 
and the psychedelics are unlike those. So if you use psychedelics, you're less likely to use other drugs of abuse, and you're not likely to get addicted to psychedelics. They're not that enjoyable or rewarding. They don't cause what's called tolerance. You don't need to use more to get the same effect. Um, so I think they have different characteristics than the opiates in that regard or cocaine in that regard. But I do think there are risks um, to um, certain groups of people with psychedelics um, that have yet to be really um, sorted out. Uh, so people who have a family history of schizophrenia um, might be at more risk of developing a psychotic illness if they take psychedelics. Same with possibly with bipolar disorder. Um, there, so that's that's one risk group. People who are su who have a history of being suicidal, um, if they use psychedelics recreationally, that could be, and, and without someone to help kind of monitor them, they might be at risk for more suicidality. This new studies show that some people are destabilized in the weeks after taking psychedelics. So I think we can learn things um, that in some ways, the psychedelics are probably different than the opiates. In some ways, um, unmonitored use can be risky. And there certainly are some pretty bad stories out there of people who took, took psychedelics without um, knowing what the drugs were going to do or without sort of a safe person to um, to help them. And the, the current F, um, process of getting FDA approval, they're... Um, those are with models with, with one or at least one, but often two therapists in the room with a patient and a lot of preparation. So it's, 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 and then kind of debriefing afterwards. So it's putting the drug within a therapeutic framework, which I, I think makes the risk a lot, a lot lower. Uh, but we'll see. Once these drugs are out there, Oregon started their program uh, for providing it uh, mushroom for mm -hmm. mushrooms. So there's, there's a natural experiment going on. We'll find out. Um, I, I, my concern would be both public safety, you don't want people to have bad outcomes, but also bigger picture, you don't want them to be banned again. You know, you don't want to have such a uh, excitement and, and over enthusiasm, and then it could backfire, and then we could end up going back to schedule one again. So I, I think it's best to, to really do it in a thoughtful way if they're being restudied and reintroduced. Right. We have a couple of questions actually about schizophrenia, and you mentioned that psychedelics probably are not appropriate for patients with schizophrenia due to increased risks. Um, but we know at the same time that it can be a pretty debilitating disease. Can you talk about any new therapies that are available to help patients with schizophrenia or new neuroscience methods that can help treat the negative symptoms of schizophrenia? Um. Well, schizophrenia is not my area, so I don't know if I have much to, to say okay. about that. Um, there are definitely, um, I mean, I, I think that one of the, um, you know, with, if, if you're looking at different, different components of uh, neuro, neurological, neuropsychiatric functioning, you can then design drugs that would be focusing on different um, brain transmitters and chemicals and so on. But so I think you, there's a potential of finding things that will enhance uh, uh, functioning and decrease negative symptoms um, while not increasing risk. So I think psychedelics probably increase risk. Um, there's, there's a funny thing about psychedelics, which is I mentioned the, um, the spiritual experiences and the brain network effects. And there's actually researchers who are studying, have developed drugs that have the same effect on brain receptors, but don't cause a trip. And so those actually might be interesting because they stimulate, it's called the serotonin 5-HT2A receptor. And so if you gave a person a drug that, that affected that receptor, but didn't cause the d disconnection from reality, the hallucinations, the cognitive changes, it might potentially have a positive effect on brain networks without, cause, without having the risk also possible, might not help at all. But that's why people right. do studies. But if, if it did help, that would potentially suggest that the, the theory of the un unconscious mind aspect of psychedelics isn't the contributing factor. Is that Right. Correct? So that's, that's, I mean, there's a lot of really great thought experiments out there. It would be really yeah. great to get them funded because that would actually 
be a really interesting thing. If the if the mystical spiritual experience is essential, then at least you know that yeah. it is. If it isn't, then right. you could basically save a lot of effort, time, money, and potentially difficult experiences. At least for those people, there, I'm sure there's people who want to have a trip, but there might be people who just want might be people who just want the effect without going through a trip. Yeah. That's fair. We have a couple of other questions. Um, we have someone who asks kind of algorithms, I think, is what it's getting to. For a client who has been unsuccessful with depression treatment, how should they decide which treatment makes sense next? Magnetic, electric stimulation, or psilocybin? Um, that's a great question. And this is so one of my gripes <laughs> that I was getting to is that the National Institute of Mental Health, which is based in Washington, where you guys are, um, doesn't really support psychedelic research. And it's a shame because this is such an interesting area. They should. Um, but to answer that question of what to do next for depression, when in the 1980s, there was a study called the STAR-D study, 1980s and 90s. And it was a study that looked at different serotonin reuptake inhibitors, Prozac, Zoloft, and Wellbutrin, tricyclics, and looked at the existing antidepressants that were available and tried to answer that question, what's the best treatment for this person if they don't respond to this or that? What we don't have now is for the new treatments, which are inspired by neuroscience, so ketamine, psilocybin, even ECT, which has been around for a long time, MDMA, uh, 5 amino dmt toad venom from toad venom. Uh, we don't know the relative benefits of any of those treatments compared to the other treatments. So we have just uh, rules of thumb and clinical wisdom to, to rely on. We don't really know if someone didn't respond to psilocybin, should they get MDMA? Or if they didn't respond to ketamine, should they get ECT or should they get psilocybin? So I actually think another thing that the National Center of Mental Health should, should support would be studies in that area because we need, with treatments that are now being used very extensively, by the way, um, we need to know which is best and which is not so good and which is better for who. So I assume that there is lobbying happening. There, is there an effort to affect policy? There's been numerous efforts to affect policies uh, a lot of them have focused on statewide initiatives uh, to de decriminalize and legalize. Um, there's been a lot of centers, uh, research centers set up, and there's definitely been pressure on the National Institute of Mental Health and other NIH um, divisions to, um, to open up more research. There's been a little trickle, but not a, not a big flow. So they funded, the National Institute of Drug Abuse has funded a study or two National Institute of Mental Health has funded a couple of studies, but not centers or programs or um, other kinds of mechanisms that would really open the floodgates. So a lot, of, and those are questions that industry doesn't, doesn't, you know, the drug companies, these little startups and the foundations, they, they don't have the resources and they're not that interested in. I, I'm curious to see how, as it becomes more readily adopted in, say, other countries in Europe, et cetera, what effect that would have on, on our domestic policy. Um, there is a question by Stephen. He asks if there's any relation between the revolutionary eras of the mind and the deinstitutionalization of mental health patients. Um, uh, yeah, thanks, Stephen. Um, so that's a great question. I think the... the um, Deinstitutionalization, I think, started before uh, DSM really um, took hold, DSM-3, but I think it was accelerated by that. And the idea that you have effective ways of making diagnoses and providing treatments is great, but it doesn't mean that the people who are in state hospitals are going to be able to access them and are going to be in stable living situations and have enough resources and get themselves to treatment. So it was... It was a sort of a wishful thinking um, that started, I think, under President Kennedy. So it was long before DSM-3, but has been continued. And now we see that there's transinstitutionalization. People have been put in jail who have mental disorders. There's obviously a lot of people on the subway and the streets of this country with mental disorders and without. But it's, it's um, I don't think it's been 
cause and effect. I think it's just influenced it, but um, um, it's a social, it's a social policy, political issue more than it is something that psychiatry has control over. So we are running close to our, you know, the end of our discussion. I would love if you could share one anecdote or one encounter that you felt was really transformative for you. You have so many stories that you share in the book. Is there any that really stood out? Um, I, well, I think the, the, one of the ones that stood out when I first came to Columbia in the year 2000 was I was, I would go back and forth between uh, my Upper West Side office uh, and, and Uptown Columbia um, Presbyterian Hospital area where the Psychiatric Institute is near the George Washington Bridge, go back and forth and back and forth. And I would hear um, presentations by neuroscientists and um, uh, uh, really cutting edge researchers. So one of the times, um, um, was uh, Eric Kandel gave a talk about um, on, in neuroscience, and he was talking about uh, uh, something about what's called the safety centers of the brain. So we're very used to the idea of fear in psychiatry, even from you know from college biology classes. You take a little mouse and you put it in a cage, and the floor is electrified, and the mouse gets afraid and huddles in the corner. So you're very, there's a lot of models about trauma that focus on fear and, and um, avoidance and freezing and fight and flight, that kind of thing. But what Kandel was talking about that day was something else, which was was called the safety center. So that the parts of the brain that actually activate when someone feels that they're safe and calm and relaxed. And uh, um, I always thought of it as something like, um, you're playing freeze tag and then there's a bell rings and everybody can, doesn't have to freeze, they can kind of go about their, their business. Or at the end of like a war, there's an armistice and bells ring and everybody goes into, you know, comes out of their bunkers and goes into public spaces and is very happy. So, but the connection I made that day was between his, his model, which was based on research studies with some of his faculty and um, patients I was, was seeing where they were describing feeling safe after long treatments for uh, panic and uh, uh, PTSD disorders. And so this was like a kind of kooky out of left field um, kind of get wild guess. But it, then it turns out there's actually researchers who have expanded on this idea over time and are actually doing safety conditioning as opposed to fear conditioning. And it's actually a whole line of research at this point. So to me, it was like a cool example of the lab to patient connection. And even though it's a huge jump, because I couldn't put a person in the scanner to say, well, your safety center is active. But it was also, it was a way of thinking of how to help this person move into a world that would be not just absence of fear, but presence of safety. So it was kind of the model that I then started thinking about how could you connect these very, very disparate worlds and what kinds of things would be ways to kind of help them retell their stories. And have there been any patient encounters that really stood out to you or you felt transformed you? Um, With well, there was, there was a, yeah, there was another patient who I saw who had been really, really traumatized and um, had gone through major losses and abuse of different kinds. And she refused medication. Um, and there were reasons that she should be taking, uh, at least from my perspective, antidepressant type medication, which could have blunted a lot of her symptoms. And she decided instead that she was going to pursue a practice of yoga. And she did that in a very intense way for, um, for a number of years. She actually became a yoga instructor, but it was an interesting, she was holding her ground. She really didn't believe the medicines were, she had had them before. She knew the pros and cons. And she really said, no, I'm going to really essentially remake myself, remake my mind. And she was able to really overcome the fear responses and um, the avoidance and became almost like a different person. And it was an intense, laborious process for her. But it, to me, it was like, oh, this is not just a fringe activity. It's not just something to make you feel better. This actually could be used in a therapeutic, serious therapeutic way. Mm -hmm. 
I love that. Um, I want to give you the opportunity to share any last bits of knowledge that you'd like to share, anything. You know, I've plugged the book a few times, so go read it. <laughs> it's fantastic. Uh -huh. They are wonderful, like I said, imagery. There are characters and anecdotes. You don't typically see that in these kind of books. You don't typically see that in books that are outlining the evolution of a field. So I thought that was a refreshing approach to talk about it. Um, but any last bits or, you know, food for thoughts that you'd like to leave us with before we round out tonight? Um, I just think it's a really exciting time. It was funny because I was, um, my kids are launched, my, uh, you know, we're getting older, my wife and I, we moved back into the city and we're like, okay, we'll sort of cut down our activities and prepare for retirement. And then the, the psychedelic kind of revolution happened. And I'm like, oh, this is so cool. I want to be around for the next chapter. So to me, the the sort of um, rethinking of how do we look at these conditions? How do we do research? How do we uh, develop new models has been a really, really cool thing. And I know I'm not alone. I think it's a really fun time to be part of the movement where um, one has to wear the hat, the, the scientist sort of skeptical hat, but also kind of a sense of wonder as well. Fantastic. Thank you, David, so much for joining us tonight, for sharing your expertise and your personal experiences. Um, I think we've all walked away with a, a better understanding of where psychiatry is now, and we're not just stuck back on that couch stage of the field. Um, so I'm sure we're going to see more from you, more work. I'll be following what happens with the psychedelics in the near future. And thanks again for all of those who joined us tonight. This will also be available on YouTube if you want to go back and, and watch because you loved it so much. You're more than welcome to do that. I hope everybody has a great night. Thanks, Francis. It was great. You're welcome. Bye.